All right, and uh, oh, that's right. This is how I'm sharing screen today. Uh, and transition. Is this working? Cool. Um, we're trying a new thing today. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, to recap, uh, the compartments proposal, compartments are a mechanism for running client code in a JavaScript environment with limited powers, isolated evaluators, unique globals, but shared prototypes. And lockdown is a mechanism for freezing shared prototypes. So compartments and lockdown are two great flavors that are better together. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they just uh, freezing shared prototypes uh, 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 is much narrower than it's, it's, freezing, it's freezing the shared primordials. So I just want to make sure that doesn't get lost. Yeah, um, I'll, 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 uh, uh, we can we can riff on this before we get it into text. The uh, I want I wanted to capture. Um, the idea as succinctly as possible um, and, uh, and elaborate in detail. Um, no, in any case, going in. Um, so one of the things that I'm proposing uh, for the proposal for compartments as it's written today is that we add a name. Um, the purpose of adding a name to a compartment is, that, well, for one, it, it, it uh, strongly parallels what exists today already for the function constructor um, and uh, it gives us a mechanism for communicating to the user in stack traces um, about the compartment that originates an error. I'm sorry, so, the fu function constructor doesn't have a name. Well, pardon, function instances have a name, right? As compartment okay. instances would have a name. Okay. Um, and the uh, and the purpose of this is that it would allow us to annotate exceptions that escape evaluators in the compartment, so that people could figure out where they originated. Um, and uh, I'm proposing adding support for loading without executing, which we've added to the SES shim, uh, and that has allowed us to do uh, to do archiving in particular. But there are a number of useful use cases for being able to load without executing. Um, it can, we can use a compartment to drive uh, the loading of uh, the transitive modules of a of a particular entry point for static analysis. Um, and uh, to capture um, uh, uh, to capture an entire application for deferred or repeated execution, which is to say that you could um, use this to drive the uh, the load hooks to um, to get all of the static module records and thereby record um, record all of those static uh, re record all of those static have it cache the the static module records so that they can be created in other compartments. Um, and, uh, and of course, our particular use case that Agora could be recording an application into an archive so that it can be loaded somewhere else. This is um, equivalent to, uh, spiritually equivalent to providing bundling, uh, providing a, 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 the foundations for writing a bundler. Um, and in particular, we've written a, a tool called a compartment mapper, which takes node modules off of the file system and creates an archive with a compartment map, which is spiritually similar to an import map, except that it puts every package in a separate compartment, which is spiritually similar to scopes. Um, and then- Scopes, I'm sorry, what are scopes? Scopes from import maps. And import maps, the scope is to say that anything underneath this URL prefix is associated with this namespace. Um, and, and in a way, this is a this is effectively an, uh, uh, an, an alternate take on how to implement import maps in user space. Okay. Um, and um, the way it works, uh, you've seen this slide before. Maybe uh, I'm hoping that we're now prepared to uh, <laughs> prepared to understand what each of these stages corresponds to. Um, the rows, uh, just um, in this way of rendering it, everything up everything up to the slide is perfectly legible. Uh, but this way of rendering it is making this slide much harder to read. Okay, uh, let me uh, attempt a last minute change of, oh, well, 
here's here's one way. Let me see if I can uh, fix it this way. Uh, uh, this this is no no. Can you, do, can you go go back to normal share? Oh 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 oh. That's is this fine. better? Uh, it's better, but the um. It fades off on the right. I I, I this needs some tweaking. <laughs> okay. Can you switch to a normal project yeah. screen for this one? Yep. Yep. All right. We're we're the experiment, but. <laughs> All right, switching to sharing my screen and bear with me as I have to fix a few things to make. Uh, as you can see, my presentation is a green screen. <laughs> this is uh, so much better, yeah. Uh, let's get it back to normal. Uh, let's do it normal entity. All right, cool. And Green background wasn't bad, actually. Yeah. Well, you know, you and Larry Wall. Uh, <laughs> are, are entitled to your dark <laughs> I, 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 the, the green isn't bad, but it would cause retina burn-in for me. So. <laughs> um, okay. Is is this uh, is this visible to everyone? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the the way this works is each of the columns is a workflow, right? Um, for a different use case. And each of the rows is a stage that some that each of these workflows may or may not need. Um, so for example- uh, let, me, let me interrupt you. I think there's some bad wrapping here. Uh, import archive um, and endowments and files on the left look like bad wrapping. Good. Yeah, for this one, it makes a difference. Good. Yeah, it. I, I hastily changed the slides, and this, this, some some inevitable artifacts have creeped in. Um, the okay. So yes. Um, so the way the way the the way that this works um, is, for example, this star indicates that this is in the import from the location workflow, searching for the uh, searching for the package containing the module is a step that's necessary, right? Um, and then um, to import, uh, import a node application from, uh, from the file system, um, the, the first step that we do is we map all of the package JSONs that we find into the corresponding compartments and then create a compartment map, uh, a JSON file that describes where to find all of the sources and how to assemble them into a working application and how to link the compartments together. Um, since every package gets its own compartment, uh, this is the step at where, where we uh, read the exports and imports properties of the package JSONs and uh, create the corresponding properties in the, in the, the compartment map. Um, and because Node is not fully expressed with exports and imports and package JSONs today, it also uh, fills in the gap uh, there for um, Inferring what those uh, inferring those cross connections with an import map hook, um, and uh, then we go on to assembling the compartments into uh, and the uh, pardon from the compartment map. We then can instantiate compartments and connect them to each other, which I call assembly. Um, and at this stage, um, none of uh, it, it has not executed. All of the all of the static module records have been loaded, and it is ready to execute. But it's also ready to pop over to some of these other workflows and do some other things that don't involve execution. Anyhow, um, then you load the compartments and import the modules. Um, uh, you assemble the compartments, then you load the modules into the compartments, and then you execute uh, by calling import, the dynamic import on your entry point. Um, and then uh, loading is, is all of that except executing. Um, which allows you to then uh, instantiate your compartment possibly more than one time, uh, your entire graph of your application possibly more than one time. Um, it just it just curries uh, the import um, and is the is the foundation for the implementation of import. Um, writing an archive is most of the same steps. We find all of the node modules off of the file system. 
um, and we assess, uh, we create the compartment map. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. The, the thing about instantiating more than once at the place you were pointing at, mm -hmm. uh, if you instantiate a given um, a static, static module record more than once, you need to be instantiating it in different compartments. Yes. By the time you reach the asterisk in the flow you were showing, well, that's true. It's bound to a compartment. That's true. Uh, and that it likely is a death sentence for load. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't think it's a death sentence for load, but I think it invalidates the claim that uh, load itself sets you up for multiple instantiation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it, yeah, we can revisit that. I, I think okay. that the implementation actually, uh, I, I think that my description misrepresents the implementation. Um, the, a lot of things are deferred to import, um, but prepared ahead of time. Eh, I'll have to look. Spiritually, this is what should be possible. Um, and, and we can, we can iron out, iron it out. Um, so writing an archive is, uh, is, is, is the, I, the process of writing an archive is finding them off of the file system and then writing to a zip file in our case. Um, we could equally do the same thing to IPS or, or whatever. Um, but the idea is find all the <laughs> modules off of the file system, put them in compartment, uh, create a compartment map, assemble them and load them and now, because of that, you have induced the uh, induced your import hook to to capture all of the sources that you need to put in the archive. So we put it in, uh, we pack it into a zip file and then write it. In the process of packing it into a zip file, um, we erase the knowledge of the specific layout of the file system on the on the on the system in which the archive was created. We're essentially, normalizing them into a zip file format where every package is. An immediate subdirectory of the root. Um, yeah, and this could there. Yeah, and zip files are okay. There are all uh, you you could do the same process and and uh, and put into a content address store like Git or into IPFS or such, um, and which has some other advantages over this approach. Um, making an archive is everything except for writing it, um, which produces a. a, a uh, in our case, a, a, a typed array that contains the, the data that would be written to the archive, and you can put it somewhere else if you wish. Um, so at that point, you've basically taken, uh, taken an application off of your file system and put it on ICE so it can be executed somewhere else. Um, so uh, the bytes of that archive can flow into parse archive directly, at, at which point you just read it, unpack it, um, and then at that point, you have something that can be assembled and executed. Um, what do the pluses oh, mean? Uh, plus, pluses indicate, oh, I don't even remember. That's the peril of not writing a legend. Um, the, uh, the, these are, I, I think that my uh, intention was that these were steps that were deferred, um, uh, that were deferred, but you could, you could execute them with a follow on. Uh, method of the artifact you got from the end of this step, right? So parsing an archive gives you an archive, an application object, and calling import on the application object takes you all the way down to import, effectively. Um, and lo load not so much. Uh, uh, I need to make some updates on here. Uh, import, uh, import takes the archive and executes it all the way to the end. Um, and, and endowments are injected here. Um, and uh, parse is based off of the bytes that you receive from make archive, whereas load and import are based off of the files you put on the file system. Uh, so, so the archive flows in this way uh, off of the files instead of through bytes. Should, uh, should parse archive not have an asterisk in the row read archive since it doesn't have that, since it's, 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 it's it's um, you know it's coming from a flow that did not have an asterisk in write archive. Uh, load, pardon. Yes, I think that that's it. I think that this is this the change you're describing. No. Is this the change you're describing? No. <laughs> uh, let, let me describe it again. Uh, the, the the row named read archive. 
the row named read archive up here. Right, mm -hmm. and parse archive. Parse archive um, is, is the, the, the thing ah, yes. that you do after, okay. Yes. Thank yeah, you. Right. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to take these pluses out because they are simply confusing. Okay. Uh, load, parse and load both give you the same thing. They just come from different origins. Yeah, this is correct. Okay, good. Um, okay. With that, that'll be finding its way back into a Git repository <laughs> shortly. <laughs> um, okay. So with that in mind, uh, in order to implement such a thing, it is necessary to be able to create a graph of compartments that have cross linkage, right? We need to be able to have one compartment that, ha that, uh, that is able to load modules from another compartment. And to that end, we're proposing the addition of a module method on the compartment object, on compartment instances, which would give you the name, uh, a proxy for the namespace, or rather an exotic object representing the namespace of the, of the module that would eventually be executed. Um, and the, one of the keys about this is that it, it, you can do this before you have loaded the module, it, uh, before you even know that this module could exist in the compartment. Um, and the reason for doing this is for simplicity in the API. It is that we, the compartment, uh, compartment API already receives this module map um, uh, object as an argument uh, according to the current proposal. And it accepts in its value place either a module namespace object or the string name of uh, the module from the parent compartment, which would allow you to take sources with, uh, even, if even if there isn't a static module record involved in the system, as is the case for modable success. Um, it allow in excess's case the way you get uh, you, the way you get modules into a child compartment is by naming the uh, the static module record implied to exist in the parent. Um, the uh, and, and but for the dynamic module loader we need the ability to 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 do cross linkage between compartments and and in order to do that we need a mechanism to refer to a module that will be loaded in another compartment um, and. Uh, there are variations on this idea, but this is the one that most cleanly fits with the existing proposal. Um, and uh, and with this, so with this idea, if I were to say from the parent compartment load the entry point module, which I'm suggesting is called dot in this particular case, um, uh, the what would happen is that if if the the um, the import hook brings in a static module record for a module that requires, uh, that imports something called dependency as a, as a full specifier. Uh, the compartment would look to the module map instead of the import hook to find that dependency. And in this case, it would see, ah, this is a module namespace from another compartment. And it would go and ask that compartment to, to produce, uh, to, to produce uh, the, the names uh, to, to execute the namespace of that module and and thereby make it available to the dependency in this compartment. It also Wait, you mean execute the namespace pardon, into uh, pardon. In this case, it's uh, affecting the load, not the link and execute. I'm sorry. Um, load is is the is the preloading function. Right? That's right. In this case, it would induce the dependency compartment to load index.js but not execute it. Right. Good. Um, I'm then uh, we are proposing the addition. This was kind of implied. We're proposing the addition of a static module record constructor to the to the proposal, um, and the static module record constructor is uh, a, it's a function that accepts the source of a of an ESM module. Um, and optionally, its location for the purposes of, of, uh, of uh, populating the um, exceptions thrown from within that uh, from within that module. Uh, it 
occurs to me that this actually is more tightly bound than we want it to be. And we probably need to remove the location from that and find another way to get that to propagate through exceptions. But uh, bear with me as I do my stunts live. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the intent is that you would provide a load hook function to the compartment constructor. Um, this load hook would be responsible for uh, finding the location for a particular module specifier in the scope of that compartment, um, and then retrieving the source by whatever means uh, by whatever means the source can be uh, obtained in that compartment, and then constructing a static module record for the source at that location. Um, and it occurs to me that we need to find another way to thread the location, uh, but uh, we'll we'll talk about that offline. I think. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, to be clear, would, would separate the um, the resolve operation, um, but but I guess you you have this problem because you don't have a canonical scheme that both takes into account the compartment and the resolve specifier within the compartment. You you're kind of um, uh, yeah. We need a mechanism that threads meta uh, the import meta URL, which is what that location is supposed to be and also ensure that exceptions thrown um, for things like parse errors of that module include the location. Um, so, so, so I didn't catch what was wrong with this way of threading the location. Uh, the idea, I believe, for static module records is that they be reusable across compartments and the location, um, the location is not necessarily the same across compartments. It is, it is in practice um, that this might be okay. Um, I think, I th yeah, I, I, uh, my inclination is that it's okay, but I think I understand the problem and I haven't really thought about it. Are, are you intending static module record to enable um, bundling use cases as well here, or is that kind of just a side effect of this proposal? Um, in the bundling use case, you would uh, in the bum bundling use case, you would pro provide a load hook that's just like this, except that before returning the static module record, it would write the source to a side table and note where or, it had come from. I guess what I'm saying is, if if you say that portability is not a specific issue in this case, that the existence of a static module record constructor in the environment means that you can create ad hoc bundling systems using it. It is true. Uh, and, yeah. and transform systems. So it's, it's quite, I mean, the, and those are both like useful things, um, but they're important aspects of its implications. Um, and, and there the portability question should also be con considered. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is, this is where you would conduct, this is the function where you would do um, source to source transforms. Um, before returning a static module record, um, and that and you're right, this is this is an important aspect of the API that we that is deliberately present. Um, uh, do you do you foresee objections to that idea? Um, I, I just think that the original uh, suggestion of um, trying to maintain location portability might be useful, um, so that modules can um potentially be relinked um because otherwise there might be some uh subtle edge cases with that in those kind of scenarios mm -hmm. yeah the relinking the re uh, is are, are you suggesting that when you relink you do not necessarily want the location to be the same um i i guess yeah if you've got two versions of the same module that came from, say, a static bundle uh, and, and or, or some collection of modules that was pre-populated. And you, um, you, you want two different linked versions of that module, you might not necessarily want them both. So if location can affect effectively both resolution and the error stack, or is it, is it only affecting the error output? It only affects the error stack. It, right. it, it does not affect resolution. 
Yeah, um, then I guess I guess it might be okay then if it if it's only the error and it's not expectable, inspectable. If if the location is inspectable on the instance, then it it will be used in resolution somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere. Oh, and it's it, and, and because it does surface as meta as the import meta URL, it'll certainly be used for resolution of, of neighboring assets. Right. Um, so as soon as it's affecting that, then then that portability is an issue. Yes. Um, just to be clear, import meta does not map to absolute location on the web. Truly, interesting. Uh, yeah, it's response location, but uh, cache location is request location. Yeah, I think I think import meta has to be a independent hook. Um, yes, it does. It does, okay. and, and is and is currently specified as something else at the moment. We haven't implemented it in the shim. Okay. I just wanted to bring it up because we're talking about it actually mapping to a location. Yeah, you you are correct. You are correct. Um, this wouldn't be the mechanism that threads import meta URL um, or any of the other metadata. Um, the, there is in 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 the in the proposal as Bradley has written it today. Um, there is uh, there is an import meta hook that is separate from this. Um, so the location is probably yeah. I I move that we strike location from this from this API. Um, I, I think the main thing was just as long as it's non you know like like uh, like an error stack normally that the, the information is not explicit to the user. So it's fine um, as long as the same sort of invariant applies here, where it's it's not something that that users can sort of pick up and start using as as yeah. As though error stacks are something yeah. users can pick up and start using on. Um, uh, yeah, on um, I, but I mean it, it's it it happens and it's it's done. But I mean it, yeah, it's it's more like the import meta URL that I think is is the worrying aspect for sure. For if that's sure. not the case, then it might not be such a concern. Okay, well let's um. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm separately very, you know, um, working on the, on the issue of uh, Jordan and I have a um, uh, proposal for error stacks. Um, and um, with the also the work I'm doing in the session, um, I'm definitely um, interested in what locations uh, are shown through the error stacks, but I think I think we don't need to take more time. I think we can note that this is an issue to come back to. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Yeah, um, each of these proposals will eventually make its way to uh, an issue on the proposal on the TC39 uh, repository we can discuss at length. Um, and uh, okay, so that got us ECMAScript modules. It does not get us linkage with any other third-party module system, and it is to be this this static module record we're turning here is special for ESM and does allow ESM style linkage, um, and because of that, it it hides many of the details about how that is affected. So there's a sort of a, a, there is a hidden contract between static module record and compartment, presumably in the specification that would be done via internal slots. Um, but there is no user space mechanism for implementing the linkage between these two things. Uh, um, in, in particular, because that is not specifiable. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the implementations of ESM are free to do uh, uh, the, the, the linkage in a number of ways uh, that, that are not user observable. Um, Okay, so I'm proposing that we add a third party static module interface. That is to say, you can, instead of returning a stat static module record in the previous slide, you could return a, a record object that implements, that has this structure. It has an imports array and exports, uh, an exports array, uh, a re exports array for export star support, and an execute method that receives uh, the, prox the internal proxied exports object. Uh, and the compartment originating the request and the resolved exports for uh, the cor that correspond to the imports array in the context of this compartment, right? Um, because these are pre-computed, there's no need to say compartment dot resolve uh, resolve hook, which is not even possible. And this is just, um, uh, with this API, but uh, this is just a function that will need to be async in order to implement top-level await. 
um, that executes the body of a module, either a common JS module or a WebAssembly module or, or some such. Or a JSON um, module. Or a JSON module. And we have implemented common JS and JSON to an extent um, in, uh, in our compartment mapper implementation. This resolved exports the, um, the module namespace exotic object. Uh, no, proxied exports is uh, <laughs> proxied exports is a normal object, uh, and it is not identical to the namespace object that is returned by import or um, uh, import or module. It is um, the the. The module namespace object returned by uh, module oh. and import is the exotic module namespace object. Then, then should it be resolved imports on the far right? Uh, yes, it should. Yes, yes, yes. And that itself is an object um, with with uh, with uh, um, <laughs> with uh, Import uh, import specifiers here, and this has imports the corresponding import specifiers as keys here, and the full the corresponding full specifiers as values. WebAssembly defines a similar object in its instantiation. Oh well, that's handy. Um, let's. Uh, Mark once told me that Alan Kay had a saying that similar things should either be the same or recognizably different. Um, you're muted, Mark. You are still muted, Mark. So there you similar, are. similar things should be made uh, either the same or very different. Yeah. Um, so which let's. Is, uh, which, is, which, 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 in my experience, it turned out to be a wonderful heuristic. So what we ought to do is look into um, how similar this is to what WebAssembly does already, and make it the same. I think. Um. Okay, uh, so the way it, this would look is that in a, a compartment, you would uh, write an import hook or a load hook, as it were, um, that re, uh, returns a, uh, an object that may be frozen um, that has the imports array and optionally export uh, optionally the the uh, exports and re-exports, um, and it implements execute uh, execute with a proxied exports. And the compartment and the resolved imports, the resolved imports give it the ability to await upon the import from another compartment or, uh, or some such. Um, and proxied exports dot default equals 42 is equivalent to exporting the default variable 42. Um, and so within this function body, you can implement, uh, implement the execution for an arbitrary other module type. Are we good? <laughs> Any questions about this one? Okay. Um, uh, so next topic, uh, I'm proposing that we add a module map hook option to the compartment constructor. And this is uh, the dynamic fallback for the module map argument. And the idea is that in some cases, you can know what the module map up front. But in the compartment mapper's case, you can't. Um, or pardon, the compartment mapper for implementing node does not allow you to do that because you do not know all of the modules that are exported by another compartment by looking at its package JSON. Um, and also, there is the possibility of cyclic dependencies across compartments, which also um, is not possible to implement if if the if all of the linkage needs to be known upfront upon construction of the compartment. So um, the module map argument is uh, the mar module map hook is a fallback. So provided that a key is not present in the module map, you can look you can call the module map hook, uh, and if it returns a an, a defined value, that is what would have been a value in the module map. Um, as a reminder, the values of the module map are either a string name from the parent compartment or 
um, a namespace object from, um, uh, from this or another compartment. Uh, this also incidentally solves the problem of, uh, of aliasing within the same compartment. You can use this to implement a module map hook that says that uh, this module specifier in this compartment is an alias for another module specifier in the same. Yeah, so again, this helps us with, this allows us to do aliases within the same compartment, uh, mutual dependencies between modules in separate compartments, and uh, linkage to modules in other compartments that are not knowable at the time of construction of the compartment. For example, files off of the uh, files in Node.js packages that are not mentioned in package JSON. Let me just make sure I understand. The mutual dependency means uh, you can have an import cycle that's across compartments. That's correct. Okay. Um, which is not something that we necessarily need or want, but something that falls out of this. And just, <laughs> just to highlight that it, it extends the possibility. A possibility that exists today within a compartment becomes possible across compartments with this. Mm -hmm. um, I am also proposing, let me move my things around, uh, and uh, that we remove the import now hook from the proposal. This turns out to be vestigial. Um, the import hook being renamed lo load hook clarifies that these are from separate phases. Um, the, uh, the, the name load hook now is contradictory. Um, loading may be asynchronous, importing may be synchronous. Um, and any necessary loading can be done from the load hook and any necessary executing can be done by a static module record. So this is simply not a necessary feature. Okay, I think that's great. Uh, this has been, uh, in particular, as we've been presenting this to other audiences, um, the import now hook has been a repeated source of resistance. Um, uh, uh, Peter, uh, the original suggestion for import now hook uh, came from uh, Modable. Um, are you satisfied that this way of refactoring the concerns um, addresses the issues? Uh, sorry, I was uh, muted. Um, I, I, I believe you that it addresses the same issue and I acknowledge that it's been, uh, important now has been a topic of some uh, controversy, um, but we need to go back and look at this a little bit to see what the um, what the uh, impact is. Okay, in particular, just to talk it out a little bit, uh, the the standard modable configuration and TC53 configuration, where uh, everything is pre-compiled, uh, there is no loading. There's only a world that already starts with all of the pre-compiled modules as static module records. So the fact that the static module records um, uh, you know, can, um, can be executed immediately, um, I, think, uh, I think this factors out the fact that loading, which you're not concerned with anyway, is the thing where the asynchrony is necessary. Uh, you yeah, know, uh, un understood. There is, uh, I, I want to understand what it ends up looking like um, in our code. And there is, um, there's a funny in between edge case where we actually do sort of arguably load modules at this point. And so I want to look at what that, what that all means. But um, I, I don't have any express concerns here other than um, it's, it's a lot to, to absorb at once. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it strikes me as possible um, that if that's the case, there might be a need, need for a load now hook, and uh, this could be reframed as a rename. Um, but uh, it, it would be nice if that turns out to not be possible. Uh, pardon, not to be necessary. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's let's discuss further. I I can create issues for this so that we can have an anchor for a, a conversation. Sure. You know, happy, happy to look into it. It's, uh, it's definitely uh, a, a place that needs to be uh, tightened up. So um, cool. anyway, just, yeah. just as a reminder, you say there that um, importing maybe barring top level await. Uh, 
and, and this discussion has been about the load hook, but is, is there a proposal, are you proposing a, a synchronous import? There is a current proposal for an import now um, that is a synchronous import. Um, right, okay, and, thanks. Uh, yeah, which, which is, which is uh, my next slide. Thank you for, thank you for the segue. <laughs> um, so top level of weight has some ramifications that were not taken into account in the original proposal. Um, so static module record may need, uh, we, we, uh, we may need to uh, surface to the compartment API whether a module has top level of weight or not. So to, in, uh, to induce it to, to behave according to the existing specification, um, which is, uh, it, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure whether the compartment needs to know this upfront, um, but it may be necessary. Um, my understanding is that um, uh, subgraphs of the module system that are all synchronous Will tend to uh, will will not be executed asynchronously. They will be executed synchronously. So it may be necessary for the compartment API in order to implement top level await to know whether a module record corresponds to a module that is async or synchronous. Um, and uh, and also um, since uh, since a particular entry point may or may not transitively include uh, um, a, a top level of weight, it may be possible for us to have, for those special cases, special cases, the ability to call import now as specified today and still get the, the, uh, the namespace populated synchronously. Um, but that gets a little ugly, potentially. Um, and we'd have to make some decisions. Uh, we'd, we'd have to make a design decision to either fold import now into import, which would return a promise regardless of whether it was executed synchronously, um, or we would need to, or we would need to have an import now um, and return, return maybe return a promise only if it needs to be, uh, and, you know, only if that entry point closes over a top level await in its transitive dependencies. Um, so having a top level await infects that module and anything that depends upon it, that it will need to be imported, that the import function will need to return a promise for that case. Um, I think that the I think that the clearest and easiest, most obvious thing to do from an end user's perspective is for us to delete import now from the API and always and have the import method always return a promise regardless of whether the uh, whether the, the graph executes synchronously or not. Okay, so I've got two counterpoints to that, if I can briefly interject, if you don't mind. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, so I, I like the idea that you could get some kind of unification. You could imagine this import function running completely synchronously for a sync graph, and that integrates with the spec just fine. Um, uh, I mean, if you had, but you, you're still effectively um, if elsing the whole graph. And, and you, it's, it's not a lot of wrapper code, but it's still wrapper code on the code path where you, you're gating the entire import process to throw if there's an async um, node in the graph. That information should already be available. So it shouldn't be extra tra traversal to get it since we discovered that during the instantiation phase. Um, but the difference in behavior is that two things. Firstly, are you going to, um, if, you're, if you're gonna skip running the, the um, uh, task queue um, before you execute your code, which normally you would run the task queue before you um, uh, before you execute when you import. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, if you're not going to do that, any execution errors are now top level evaluation errors of the import as opposed to promised rejections potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and those two might be semantically um, you know, semantic changes to the actual import function, which might be unexpected. And so uh, what, like the unification, those, those are two real concerns of having them in the same function. Um, are you proposing that it would be necessary for us to maintain the distinction between import and import now? I think it could lead to slightly simpler semantics potentially, yeah. Okay. Now I can I'm I'm convincible on that point. Um, there are a lot of options here. Um, 
So I, if, I, if I reframe what you're proposing, um, you're proposing that we keep import now as is, that import now would only work if the transitive graph um, <clears throat> contains no module that has top level of weight. Right. Um, and, uh, and this is fine because um, this is fine because the caller can depend upon the entry module and its transitive dependencies to remain, uh, to, to be, uh, it's knowable at a particular snapshot of a program. And in, in view of maintenance of that, uh, of that system, um, we just accept as a community that having a module that it does not use top level of weight and turning it into a module that does use top level of weight has the potential to break any of your dependencies or dependees, excuse me, any of your transitive dependees who are using import now. Um, whereas um, if you were to use import or dynamic import, um, in, uh, use either the import method of the compartment, the dynamic import available within the compartment, um, both of those would return a promise regardless and be resilient against such change. Yeah, that sounds like a, a good summary of it. And I, I can appreciate that uh, the transitive dependency problem, uh, but in, in the same way that a transitive dependency turning async, um, it, it'll also break your ability to, I, I assume you, you, because if, if, you, if you really do want synchronous, um, if you want to obtain the module instance synchronously, you, you're going to be then, um, you won't be able to get it out from the promise, even though it was synchronous. So you would then have a separate operation that probably plucks it out from the registry directly or something like that, if you, if you really want your synchronous or some kind of other side channel. Um, and that's... Mm -hmm. No, the, the module method could serve that purpose. The module method would be able to get it before it even has been loaded. Right. Um, so, but then that side channel would break when any of the dependencies change to use top level of as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I think that problem is there regardless. Okay. Cool. Um, uh, Peter, do you have? Uh, an opinion of the direction we should go for top level of weight. No, that one I haven't looked at. Sorry. I, All right. Has, um, it, does, has Access already implemented top level of weight? Uh, yes, it has. Uh, and it's actually actively used. Um, and so it, it works fine. So it's there. Um, and we can certainly use that as a test bed to, to prototype whatever we, um, whatever we decide. Uh, as a direction the current, here. The current behavior of import now, if there is a top level of weight, is that it, I assume, throws an exception? Uh, that is a good question. We've tested it in the context of uh, test 262, but I don't know if we've actually tested it with compartments. That's a good question. Okay. Well, let's, uh, well, we're, you know, at Agoric, we're obviously fiddling around with excess. We're going to be fiddling around more. Maybe we can answer the question um, and, and capture that some more. Um, we are running low. So uh, how far am I? Okay, we'll resume. <laughs> we'll resume at another time. Uh, there are just a few more. <laughs> hey, this was great. All right, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>